Okay. Uh, hi, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Crawl Lecture. I'm Connie Rockasey, and I'll be moderating our lecture tonight. I'm a professor of astronomy and astrophysics, and I'm also currently the interim director of the University of California Observatories. Uh, UC Observatories is headquartered here at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, it's a multi campus research unit that operates Lick Observatory on Mount Hamilton. You may have seen it overlooking San Jose. Uh, and the technical labs here at UC Santa Cruz and UCLA. Uh, and it's the managing partner of the WM Keck Observatory in Hawaii for UC. Uh, UCO is also the center for UC participation in the 30 meter telescope project. Uh, I study the Milky Way galaxy, which is our celestial home in order to find out how it evolved to be what it is today and how other galaxies like it uh, evolved to be the universe that we see today. Uh, so this crawl lecture series features acclaimed UC Santa Cruz scientists and technologists who are grappling with some of the biggest questions of our time. So before we begin, I'd like to share a few details about the event tonight. We're using a webinar tool, so there isn't any chat function, but we will have an opportunity to answer your questions at the end of the program. So please, we invite you to submit your questions into the Q&A box at any time, uh, and, they'll, and we'll be able to get to them at the end of the, of the talk. Uh, and then uh, the last detail uh, for housekeeping is that tonight's event will be recorded. So on, on to our speaker. Uh, in this crawl lecture, Andy Skemmer, who's an associate professor of astronomy and astrophysics here at UC Santa Cruz, will explain how new technologies are allowing us to study individual exoplanets in, in detail. New instrumentation at the University of California's Keck Observatory and the impending launch of NASA's James Webb Space Telescope will allow studies of the compositions, the physical parameters, and the weather of planets orbiting other stars. I think Andy's science is just really cool, and I know you're going to enjoy the talk tonight. Uh, so let me, uh, without uh, further ado, introduce Andy. He's an associate professor in the Astronomy and Astrophysics Department at UC Santa Cruz. He earned his BA at Swarthmore College in 2006, and later his MS and PhD at the University of Arizona in 2011. His primary research interests include detecting and characterizing exoplanets with the goal of understanding their diverse properties. He is currently developing instrumentation that will be sensitive to temperature and potentially habitable planets. Additionally, he works on instruments that are optimized for focused studies of exoplanets, including uh, the LBTI, an instrument called ALES, another one called SCALES, um, an instrument called PSI, another one called PEAS, uh, and CAPIC. He's also the co-PI of the James Webb Space Telescope Early Release Science Program for Imaging Exoplanets. Uh, so with that, Andy, please take it away. Thank you so much, Connie. Okay. Yeah, so it's my great pleasure to talk to you today about exoplanets and, and the telescopes that are gonna allow us to take um, really high quality pictures of them. Um, we'll get into the telescopes and the technology a little bit as we go, uh, but I just wanted to start with a couple of beautiful pictures of the telescopes that I use and will be using soon. So on the left uh, are the twin 10 meter telescopes Keck Observatory in, on, on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. Uh, each one of these telescopes is, is the biggest in the world uh, with a 10 meter diameter. And for scale, you can see a road right here and the little cars parked next to the domes. And then on the right is what is soon to be the biggest telescope in space, the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, which is six, has a, a primary mirror that's six and a half meters in diameter. You'll, you'll notice it's, it's gold colored. It's, that's because it's an infrared telescope and gold is a better reflective material than aluminum or silver or what you're used to seeing with mirrors. But that is a, that is a mirror right there. Okay, exoplanets are planets that orbit other stars besides our sun. And uh, we obviously know about planets in our own solar system, but uh, there are all sorts of different types of planets that form in different ways outside of our solar system. So um, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I'm on Zoom and that you can shout out without being heard uh, on the other people's screens. I am wondering if anybody recognizes this image, where this image was taken. You can see it's a little grainy, but you can see. Um, a lake over here and some streams over here. Um, maybe some clouds up here. Uh, 
Some of you might think this looks a little bit like uh, Santa Cruz, uh, but in fact, it is uh, a picture of Titan from a probe that entered its atmosphere. Uh, Titan is the largest moon of Saturn. And I, I think this picture is just incredible. These are not liquid water lakes. They're actually made of hydrocarbons, methane and ethane. And these riverbeds in the clouds, they're all hydrocarbon chemistry and not water chemistry. Um, but the geology and the diversity of different sorts of objects that you can see just within our solar system is incredible. And there are even more spectacular worlds around other planets. But one thing I have to point out is that we're never going to get this close of a view, at least in our lifetimes, of an extrasolar planet. So within our solar system, you can take these beautiful images. Um, you can study a few objects, moons and planets directly. Uh, but if you want to learn about the many other types of objects that exist and study hundreds and thousands of them to study their, the, the, the aggregate properties, um, we never get a very good view. In fact, planets just look like points of light. So that brings me to Carl Sagan's pale blue dot image. This is an image from Voyager looking back at planet Earth, which is this pale blue dot right here. And this is the best image you can take from Earth you know, from our outer solar system with a telescope like Voyager. Uh, so you can imagine if you're in another solar system, it's really just going to be a single point of light. You're not going to get much more than that. And so you might wonder, how can astronomers learn anything just by looking at a single point of light? An alien astronomer looking, looking at Earth in this image, the first thing they'd notice is that it's pale blue. So um, perhaps it's blue because it has uh, liquid water oceans, and a nitrogen atmosphere. Maybe it's pale blue because it has some clouds on its surface. If the alien astronomer were to watch this over 24 hours, they would see it get um, a little bit brighter when you are looking at the continents and a little bit fainter when you're looking at the oceans. If they were to watch it for multiple periods, multiple days, they would see that every 24 days you get the same brightness modulation. Uh, and from that, they would know that a day on Earth is, is 24 hours. Um, they might see some additional variations on top of that, and that would be because of weather and things like cloud. Um, so you can learn an awful lot just by looking at a pale blue dot, and, and that's the goal of what we're trying to do. I want to point out that most of the time when we take an image, as astronomers, they're, they're black and white images. Um, this is a three-color red, red, green, blue image, so uh, that's why you can see the color at all. Um, but that's not really what we want to be doing. We want to be um, taking spectra of objects so that you can see more than just three colors at once. And so the way you take a spectrum of an object, uh, a spectrum is just a rainbow. So if you were to take this pale blue dot and pass its light through a prism, the prism would disperse the light into this rainbow. And you can basically count up as many colors as you want in the rainbow. Um, and each one of them tells you something more about the characteristics of the planet. Now, um, when an astronomer looks at a spectrum, it kind of looks like this. This is actually not a spectrum of Earth. It's a spectrum of the sun. Um, but you can see sort of at the bottom, you've got the purples and the blues and the greens, yellow, orange, red, the colors of the rainbow. And then um, interspersed in there, you can see these dark lines. And each one of these dark lines is the signature of an atom in the sun. And astronomers are pretty used to looking at these things. Um, if you look at these ones in orange, these, these deep orange ones there, those are sodium. So looking at that, you can, you can determine that there's sodium in the sun and how much there is. And this has really been the bread and butter of astrophysics for the last 100 years. Um, you, you can take an image of something, but you just learn so much more from a spectrum. So um, if, a, if a picture is a 1,000 words, a spectrum is 1,000 pictures. OK, so if we take the pale blue dot and we disperse it, here's what the spectrum looks like. And now I'm displaying this in a slightly different way. So on this bottom axis, I'm showing wavelength. And so the bluer light is on this end. And the redder light, actually infrared light, is on this end. And then um, on this y-axis, you're seeing how bright the planet is. So the planet is, Earth is brightest in the blue. That's no surprise. That's why it's a pale blue dot. Um, and it gets fainter as you go into the red. And these big dips in the spectrum are the equivalent of those dark lines I was showing you on the previous slide. 
So if an alien astronomer were able to take a picture of the pale blue dot and then also disperse it with a prism into a spectrum like this, they'd be able to learn all sorts of things about Earth. So they would see these deep lines right here, and those are at the right colors or wavelengths to be water, H2O, actually water vapor in the Earth's atmosphere. And so from that, they could, they could say, yes, this planet has an atmosphere. The atmosphere has a lot of water vapor in it. They could actually measure how much water vapor is in the atmosphere. If they're very careful, they can measure the shapes of the line, and that can even tell you how high in the atmosphere the water vapor is coming from. Um, the next important molecule that an alien astronomer might notice is this one right here. That's oxygen, O2. On Earth, oxygen is uh, created by photosynthesis of plants. And so it is, it is caused by life. And uh, we would call that a biosignature. If an alien astronomer saw oxygen on Earth, they would be very excited. Um, there are non-biological ways of getting oxygen, but some people think that seeing oxygen O2 and methane CH4 together, that that is a sure sign of life on a, on a place like Earth, that oxygen and methane um, should not exist together unless there's some sort of life creating them. Uh, if you look at the shorter wavelengths, there's something very interesting right here. Um, this is what, this region right here is what's called the red edge. Uh, so if you were to think of what plants look like, of course, plants reflect green light. That's why, that's why they look green. But if you had infrared eyes, they would actually look more like they reflect infrared. And so uh, that's why they get, there's a sudden change right here where the plants get much brighter. And that's called the red edge. And from that, you could, you could determine that maybe this planet has something that's like the plants on Earth. Okay, so that's really the goal of what we're trying to do here. We don't just want to see that pale blue dot. We want to take a spectrum of it and learn everything that we can about it. So um, that's all well and good. And honestly, the, the science that we're trying to do is relatively straightforward. We would like to see oxygen on another planet. So the problem is the technology. It is just really difficult to see a planet around another star. And that's because the, the star is so much brighter than the planet and when you're looking at a star that's far from the sun, the planet is so close to the star that it's just very difficult to see the planet in the glare of the star. So this is an image from National Geographic where they, they try to make an analogy, um, which is that imaging, imaging an earth around a sun is like trying to see a firefly next to a searchlight from 3000 miles away. Um, and you can see they had to photo edit in the Firefly because, um, of course, their cameras could not see a Firefly next to a searchlight from 3,000 miles away. But that's essentially what we're trying to do. So the main ingredient that you have to have if you want to image planets is a really big telescope. And that is our business at UC Santa Cruz. So um, this on the left is Keck Observatory that 10 meter telescope I showed you on the first slide. So that means this is 10 meters or about 30 feet across. Um, and this is its designer, Jerry Nelson, who was a professor at Santa Cruz who passed away a few years ago. Um, and Jerry's big innovation was that it's really hard to make these huge mirrors that you need to image planets, but you can make them out of um, a bunch of smaller segments. So instead of making a, a whole 10 meter mirror, you make these smaller hexagons and you put them together and make one really big telescope. So Jerry's telescope is still the biggest telescope in the world. Um, and pretty soon his technology is gonna be applied to the biggest telescope in space, the James Webb Space Telescope. And so James Webb is using the same idea, these smaller hexagons that can go together to make a big primary mirror. And don't worry, that's not a crack in the mirror. Uh, that's because the James Webb has to fold up to be able to fit into its launch vehicle. So this has always been the strategy of, of astronomers, I think, is, is if you can build a bigger telescope, you can just take, you can just take better images, higher, higher resolution, you can look at fainter things. And all the way for 400 years since Galileo, the, the goal has always been to build bigger and bigger telescopes to see further away and fainter things. Okay, so once you have your telescope image, this is, have your telescope uh, pointed at a star, this is what the star looks like. Um, it's really, really bright, like I said. 
I'm going to play a little movie here. And this is a video of sped up video of three hours of data collection. And you can see the star is pretty stable, but if you look carefully, there's something moving around it. Let me see if you can see it. I'll play it again. It's right there. So the star is staying still, but there's something moving around it. Okay, and now um, I take this data back to my home computer and I spend six months trying to remove that starlight as best as I can. And here is what I get. Can't remove the starlight perfectly, so that's what these residuals are. But now it's really clear that there's a planet orbiting this star. And I'm gonna play it and you'll, you'll see again that it's, it's moving around it. And if you look carefully, there's another one there and another one there. And another one there, you might need to be a professional to see that one. Um, I can speed this up, which will help you see them. There you go. So that's four planets that are around this star. And if I take all of these images for three hours of data collection and I put them on top of each other, rotate them and add them together, uh, here's what I get. So this is the four planets around the star HR8799. It was the first multi-planet system that was directly imaged where you could see the planets. And if you remember earlier, I said um, these planets are point sources. They kind of get blurred out a little bit by the optics, but um, to the quantum mechanical limit, this is, this is a single point of light uh, for each one of these four planets. So that, that's our first goal. Um, take the image of these planets. Um, but then the next goal is to study them as, as many wavelengths as possible. So uh, if this image is kind of like, I know I'm showing it to you with a red scale because it, it looks nice, but you can think of it as a black and white image. It's just showing you how bright these planets are um, on every pixel. Uh, you can do this at different wavelengths. So after I did this at one wavelength, I went back and tried to do it at six wavelengths, sort of like a slightly better than RGB image. And you can see the four planets and we can measure how bright they are at these different wavelengths. And it's not quite a spectrum like I showed you of the pale blue dot where you probably had 100 different wavelengths, but um, you can gain a lot of information from this. From this, we were able to determine that the planets had um, a lot less methane than we expected, and, and we were able to infer something about the chemical mixing that's going on in the atmosphere. OK, so going back to the pale blue dot image, um, we want to get more wavelengths than we have. Uh, on that one planet. And so we need to somehow be able to image this planet and take a spectrum of it at the same time. And uh, the technique that I'm going to discuss that can do this is, is called hyperspectral imaging. That's what it's called outside of astronomy. Within astronomy, it's called integral field spectroscopy. So I might slip back and forth between those two things. And the idea with hyperspectral imaging is that you're, you're taking an image at every wavelength or conversely, you're getting a spectrum of every pixel. So you might not know where the planet is, but whatever pixel the planet falls on, you get a spectrum of it, and now you can study it like an exoplanet. Uh, hyperspectral imaging is used all over the place. So um, here are some uses on Earth. So this is a remote sensing satellite where you can somebody is uh, studying the different land structures on Earth. Uh, it's used a lot in um, food quality assurance so uh, or, or, or food preparation. So these are pistachios. Um, the pistachios look different than the shell. So they shell them and then some hyperspectral imager says, okay, pick up, pick up all the things that turn up blue and not the things that turn up red. Uh, it's used for identifying gases potentially that are leaking from um, a factory. So you can, you can say, uh oh, there's some methane leaking there and some ethane leaking there. And it, it's used for quality assurance on, in pharmaceuticals. So um, all the pills look white, but you can take basically a spectrum of each one and say, uh oh, you know, these are all supposed to be green, but there's some red ones that got in there. So I'm building a new instrument that is designed specifically to do this on extrasolar planets, and we're using Keck Observatory. This instrument's called SCALES. It's the Santa Cruz Array of Lenslets for Exoplanet Spectroscopy. Um, and here is what it's going to look like. We're building it right now. So um, scales goes on the biggest telescope in the world, Keck Observatory. 
Uh, the sight there is fantastic. It's the darkest infrared sky. Um, and so that makes us extra sensitive uh, to infrared spectra of exoplanets. And you're gonna be able to take images of planets at a thousand wavelengths simultaneously. None of this spend three hours to take one wavelength or spend three nights to take six wavelengths. Um, you're gonna look and you're gonna, get, you're gonna get a thousand all at once and really get a, a real spectrum. So I'm really excited about this project. Uh, and uh, this is a, a funny time to be giving this talk. So for the last few days, this instrument has been under review by an external review committee. And uh, so six people of whom four or five I had never met before, um, all spent a few days on Zoom with us and they went over every bolt in this instrument and um, told us we should go ahead and build it. So we're really excited about that. Here's what the data is gonna look like from scales. So, um, oops. So again, we're scanning through the different wavelengths right here. Um, every one of these numbers right here, I'm, I'm getting a picture of this planet at a different wavelength. Uh, over here, this is a planet that's sort of like inside a disc. This is kind of like Saturn's rings, but around a star, which we blocked out here. And so you can see Saturn, the Saturn-like rings and the planet inside of it. And then on the right is an image of Io, which is the innermost moon of Jupiter. Um, and it has volcanoes on its surface that, that change from time to time, and sometimes they're big eruptions. And so with, with scales, we'll be able to um, get an image of all, these, all of these different volcanoes at the same time. But we're also going to be able to measure how bright they are as a function of wavelength and, and figure out their temperature. So we'll know the temperature of the volcano, how big the volcano is, and which ones are new uh, and might require more, more study. So this is, this is what the data is going to actually look like from scales. Um, cool images and, and at lots of different wavelengths. So this field has progressed pretty quickly and here, here's what it looks like from my perspective. So back in 2012, I was uh, spending all night at the telescope, only got a couple nights a year to try to do this. And I, I was able to get images of exoplanets, but this is a black and white image. So we could measure how bright they were, but only at one color at once. And then I went back a, a couple of years later and did this at six other different wavelengths. And that's kind of the equivalent of RGB imaging. And then um, with scales, we can do this at a thousand wavelengths at once. And so that's really what a spectrum is, um, where you can see all the colors in the rainbow for these planets. So this is all happening pretty quickly from 2012 to 2014, and then building a new instrument that's gonna allow us to do this in, in 2025. What do we hope to learn about exoplanets? Thinking about the, the pale blue dot and the alien astronomer looking back at it, these are the types of things that, that we would wanna learn. What kinds of planets are there that don't exist in our solar system? So our solar system has rocky planets on the inner part. It has gas giants and then ice giants further out than that. Um, through indirect methods, we've, we've learned that other solar systems have totally different types of planets. There are these things called hot Jupiters, which are like Jupiter, but really close to the sun and to their star and much brighter, much hotter. Um, there are things called super Earths, which are like Earth, but bigger. Things called sub-Neptune, which are like Neptune, but, but smaller. And we don't really know which one of these things has rocky surfaces versus gaseous surfaces. So there are all sorts of different things out there to study. We want to know what they're made out of. That's what a spectrum tells us. We want to know what molecules are in their atmosphere and what material, what raw atomic material they form from. We can measure how long their days are by watching them rotate and get brighter and fainter periodically. We can watch them go around the star and figure out how long their years are. Um, and eventually, we can figure out whether they have things like oceans or continents just by seeing the particular colors that are coming in and out of our field of view. We want to know if they are capable of hosting life. So if you were to look at Earth, you might see, OK, this thing has water. Uh, it's got continents. Um, all of this looks, it's 300 Kelvin. Um, all of these things are, are appropriate for hosting life. And then the next step is to see, do they have life? Uh, once you found a planet that looks like it could have life, can you detect a biosignature? So where we are right now is that um, we're mostly doing this with gas giant planets. And to really get a complete picture of all the different ways you can form planets, 
all the different types of planets that could have life. You want to do this for thousands of planets, much, much larger number than we have in the solar system. And that's why we need to look at extrasolar planets. OK, so um, I want to move on to the James Webb Space Telescope. And um, the James Webb Space Telescope, it's, it's smaller than Keck. And because of that, it can't see planets that are quite as close to the host star as Keck can do. Um, but for the planets that it can see, it's, it can take much more sensitive images. And importantly, it can do it at wavelengths that you can't see through our Earth's atmosphere. So there are wavelengths where our own atmosphere is opaque and we can't see anything. And so you have to be in space to be able to see those wavelengths. So that's why we're really excited about James Webb. You've probably been hearing about James Webb for a while now. I certainly have. Um, when I started graduate school, I was told, oh yeah, work in this field. When the James Webb Space Telescope launches, when you're a postdoc, you'll, um, you'll be the first to use it. So uh, we're 10 years after that now. Um, and so you've, you've heard all the news stories. NASA's James Webb Space Telescope is delayed again. Extremely delayed James Webb Space Telescope delayed again, again. NASA just launched the accursed James Webb Space Telescope already. That one was a bad idea. You want to finish the telescope before you launch it. Um, but for all those delays, um, our goal is to launch a perfect space telescope that's going to be able to do this. And let me tell you, it was worth the wait. Um, and we're there now. So I'm going to show you this video. This is James Webb. It is folded up in its launch configuration. It's in California at Northrop Grumman. And they are putting it into its shipping container to send it to the launch site. You can see everybody in their clean room suits. So this is a really high, high level clean room. And then they're putting it into its shipping container. The shipping container itself is like its own specially designed clean room. So nothing can get inside of this thing while it's traveling to the launch site. Uh, here it is getting driven away. This telescope costs $10 billion. So they drive pretty slow. There's somebody walking along with it. Uh, they take it out onto the highway in LA at three in the morning. They don't tell anybody when they're going to do it. And they, they, whatever traffic there is there gets blocked because this thing is not going to drive very fast. Um, it goes to the port in LA and it gets on a ship. This ship is carrying nothing but the James Webb Space Telescope. And, and here it goes. Uh, so the James Webb Space Telescope, it started, it, it started in, in LA. Um, or it was finished, its assembly was finished in LA, goes on the ship, goes south, it goes through the Panama Canal, and then it ends up in the, at the launch site at uh, French Guiana. So that's where it is right now. And you can see the timeline that it, it took to get there from September 26th to October 12th. Now, it was top secret when this thing left, and when it went, especially when it went through the Panama Canal, uh, for reasons that you might not expect. Um, people were worried that uh, pirates would kidnap the James Webb Space Telescope. So uh, there was a great article in The Atlantic, which I encourage you to read. It's, it's very funny, especially now that the pirates didn't steal it. Um, and I think the idea is, you know, you could hold this thing hostage because it, it cost $10 billion. But that didn't happen. And so the ship made it to French Guiana. Here it is arriving. Lots of NASA photographers there to document the arrival. And here it is in the clean room in French Guiana. Actually, NASA went down there and built their own clean room around it. They have, they have something called a contamination team. So this thing has to stay perfectly clean. And this is actually what it looks like in its launch configuration. So here's what the rocket looks like. And here's what James Webb is going to look like at the top of the rocket. It's all folded up. And you have to do that to fit it into the rocket fairing. OK, so um, the launch date is now set. It is December 18th. And in order to do that launch, uh, the, the previous satellite had to have already gone up. So um, here it is. I, I stayed up to watch this one. Uh, and this is, this is some French communication satellite. Here's the main engine, and in a second you're going to see the boosters, and once the boosters hit, there it goes. So 
So that's what that's what the James Webb launch is going to look like next month. Um, it's going to launch at four in the morning, and I for sure will be up to watch it. Okay, so um, after James Webb launches, there's a scary period of a month where it has to unfold. Um, and while it's, it's getting down to its cold temperatures and getting ready to do science. So actually, it's going to launch on December 18th. And then it's going to take six months to totally characterize everything about it and get it ready for science. And at the end of six months, what NASA decided to do was they wanted to have a small number of what they called early release science programs. And the idea was to get, you know, really exciting science into the hands of the community published as quickly as possible when James Webb was ready. And so um, internationally, uh, there were 13 programs accepted of which two had to do with extrasolar planets. And um, I'm happy to say both of those are at Santa Cruz. So um, there are two ways of studying this. So, so you can study transiting planets, which is where a planet moves in front of a star, blocks out a small fraction of the star, and the light from the star gets a little bit fainter. And from that, you can infer the presence of a planet. And then there's the direct imaging method where there's a star that you've tried to block out and a planet next to it um, that you can see nearby. So Natalie Battaglia, who's a UCSC professor, is the principal investigator of the Transiting Exoplanet Program. Um, I'm the US principal investigator of the direct imaging program. Uh, so there, you know, as soon as we're starting to get planet data uh, at Santa Cruz, um, this is gonna be a pretty exciting place. Uh, in the first year, there are a lot of different programs being led out of UC Santa Cruz, so I've, I've copied them down here. This is just the exoplanet programs. There's some extragalactic programs and uh, stellar astrophysics programs as well. Um, so the high contrast imaging of exoplanets one, I just, I just mentioned that. I've got another one where I'm looking for water ice clouds and, and weather on a nearby free-floating planet. Um, Natalie's got one. Jonathan Fortney's got one. Uh, there's a postdoc, Aaron Carter, who's got three, so that's pretty impressive. So um, all sorts of different planetary-like programs, and this is all just in the first year, um, the exoplanet programs that are being led, led at UCSC. Uh, I'm going to mention a few of the things that I think are going to be really exciting in the first year or two with James Webb. So this is, this is uh, the one I was just talking about. This is uh, water clouds on a free-floating Jupiter. So there's an object that's just about eight light years away from here, and it's the size of Jupiter, but maybe five times as massive, it's squeezed into the same size. And we think that this object has water clouds. So with the James Webb Space Telescope, we're going to watch this thing as it's rotating, and we'll see it get brighter and fainter. And from that, we're gonna be able to tell whether we're seeing sort of hot spots or cold spots, and we'll be able to figure out what their composition is. Uh, and we think this thing is going to look quite a bit like Jupiter. I'm showing you sort of an infrared version of what Jupiter might look like with uh, these holes in the clouds where you can see uh, deep in, and that's why it's bright right there. But unlike Jupiter, which has weird clouds like ammonium phosphate and things like that, this object is the right temperature to have water clouds. Um, and so if we see it get brighter and fainter and we see the right spectral signature, it, it will be the first object outside of our solar system uh, with water clouds. Um, another one that's really exciting uh, is, is it's going to be our, our first real look at rocky planets. Um, these are not necessarily rocky planets that look like the ones in our solar system, although the artist's conception was uh, optimistic about this. Um, but the, the planetary system that everybody's really excited about is called TRAPPIST-1. And uh, this is not to scale, but if you, if you had the sun, it would be this big yellow dashed circle, and then this... Um, this red star right here is, is the relative size of the star. So it's a really small star that these planets are around. Uh, and then the planets are blown up just so that you, you can see them. Um, but this thing has seven planets that we know of right now. And a couple of them might be at the point that they would have liquid water on their surfaces. We don't expect to be able to detect the liquid water um, with James Webb, but at this point, we're hoping to see whether they have atmospheres at least. Um, so I think this is going to be a really exciting step on our way to, to looking for biosignatures. And another one that I think will be really cool is um, rocky planet surfaces. So um, 
we'll be able to do this, but only on a few of the sort of weird ones. So I, I mentioned that there are planets that go around other stars that look very different than the planets we have in our own solar system. And here's an artist's conception of one. Um, so if you're really, really close to the star, uh, you could, you could, the planet going around, it's gonna be really hot and it's probably gonna have volcanoes on its surface. And so we think that James Webb would be able to detect this volcanism as, as the planet is going around the star. And you'll see hot spots and less hot spots. You'll be able to measure the material of the volcano, um, like what kind of rock it's made out of, and you might be able to see it change. So those are a few of the cool things that you might be able to do with James Webb that we, we have not been able to do before. Okay, so um, Keck and Scales, and then the James Webb Space Telescope, those are the big things that are happening uh, for me in the next 10 years in terms of exoplanet imaging. But it's never too early to start thinking about the things that come beyond that. And so two weeks ago, um, there was a big report that came out that recommended the next generation of large telescopes. So every 10 years, uh, the United States National Academy of Science convenes a panel um, of world experts to think about what are our top scientific priorities. Um, and this panel had oh, about 10 or 15 people on it. One of them was Jonathan Fortney, who's a professor here at UC Santa Cruz. And Jonathan, you couldn't get anything out of him. It was, it was a complete secret until two weeks ago. Nobody knew what the top recommendations were gonna be. Um, but we were very happy that the US ELT program, US Extremely Large Telescope program was the top recommendation from the ground. And uh, that includes the 30 meter telescope, um, which is University of California's next big telescope after the Keck Observatory. And then it recommended a space telescope, which doesn't have a name yet. Some people are calling it Lubex. It's a combination of other telescope names. And this would be a telescope that's about the same size as James Webb, um, six meters in diameter, um, but its surface is much more um, perfectly polished so that it can image these really faint rocky planets around nearby stars. So this, this telescope would be able to image rocky planets um, around nearby stars at visible wavelengths. The 30 meter telescope could, could potentially do that around um, smaller stars at visible wavelengths and maybe normal sun-like stars at infrared wavelengths. So these are things that are coming in um, uh, the 2030s and the, the 2040s. So they're a long ways away, but to, to work on projects this big, um, you, need to, you need to start doing them well in advance. So I wanted to end by saying a little bit about what has happened in exoplanets over the last 20 years and what's gonna happen over the next 20 years. Uh, I chose 20 years because that's the age of the UCSC undergraduates. And um, it's sort of amazing to think about what has happened in their lives already with exoplanets and what's going to happen um, in, in the next 20 years of their lives. So um, yes, it shocks me every day, the UCSC undergrads, uh, many of them were, were born in the 21st century. Uh, the first image of an exoplanet was taken in 2008. The first habitable planet, that doesn't mean that it's inhabited, but that it potentially could be inhabited, uh, was discovered in, in 2011. Uh, rapidly, we've been able to find more and more exoplanets. And so via indirect methods, not taking an image, but seeing the effect of the planet on the star. Uh, the thousandth exoplanet was discovered um, around 2014. Um, We've now done statistical surveys of exoplanets. And so we know that one out of every two stars probably has a habitable planet. That's important because when we launch one of those big space telescopes that takes 20 years to build, we wanna know that when we point at a star and are capable of seeing an exoplanet, there's probably gonna be one there. So that's kind of like a few of the highlights of the last 20 years, um, you know, just thinking about starting from the first image of an exoplanet um, and, and all the way out to knowing that exoplanets and habitable exoplanets are common. And so I thought about what we might learn in the next 10 years and in the next 20 years. Um, a lot of this is gonna happen really fast. James Webb launches in a month. Six months after that, we're gonna have data. And it usually takes astronomers another six months to a year to write the paper. So you can expect by 2023, you're gonna start 
might start seeing some of these results. So we're gonna, we're gonna be able to detect water clouds on exoplanets. Um, we're gonna be able to detect uh, atmospheres on rocky planets. And we're gonna be able to detect volcanism on rocky planet surfaces. And uh, the science here really is shared between the big ground-based telescopes like Keck and the big space-based telescopes like James Webb. You, you, they're they're complementary and they can each do different things. So for example, this water clouds one, um, that's something we might be able to do with free floating planets with James Webb very soon uh, in 2022 and 2023. And then by 2025, scales would be able to do this on Keck. So um, a lot that I think is coming in the next decade. Uh, the decade after that, um, I think I think right now we haven't imaged a large number of gas giant exoplanets, but I think that that population is going to go way up. So maybe we'll have, maybe we'll have imaged 100 gas giant exoplanets by then. It's going to be easy to image gas giants by then. It will be hard to image rocky planets, but sometime in that decade, I think we'll image the first one and, and hopefully more. And once you've imaged a rocky planet, um, and 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 then you can disperse it with something like an integral field spectrograph, so that you can. Um, get a spectrum of the image and take that pale blue dot image and, and look for things in it. That's when I think we really begin the search for biosignatures on other planets. So that's also going to happen um, in, the, in the decade after the one that we're in right now. OK, so um, the last thing I'll say is that there are other James Webb events going on here at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, we only found out about the launch date very recently, so this had to get set up very quickly. But um, there's going to be event, an event on December 14th at the UCSC Hay Barn. Um, we have a, uh, uh, a website right here. I'm not sure if all the information is up there yet, but it, it should be up there very soon. And I um, hope to see all of you there in person. Um, and with that, um, looking forward to a smooth launch 30 days from now. Um, and I'll be watching nervously and then we'll be ready to do science. So thank you very much. All right, Andy, thanks for a great talk. Uh, you've got plenty of questions. Uh, so, uh, we're going to jump right in, uh, plenty of great questions too. So the first one is, uh, you talked several times about big telescopes. So why a bigger telescope? What does it provide? You know, it, it it provides a couple of things. So the more mirror that you've got, the more photons from the planet you can you can sense, and you can get this instead of having a um, really noisy picture, you can get a high quality image. And that's true for all fields of astrophysics. That the bigger the telescope, the more data you can collect quicker. But for extrasolar planets, there's an additional thing, which is that um, how close you can see a planet to the star is proportional to how big the telescope is. So if you have, for example, the 30 meter telescope, you can see planets that are three times closer to the star than you can if you have the 10 meter telescope like Keck. Um, so there's, and, and that is, um, that's a quantum mechanical limit. Uh, how close you can see a planet to the star is a law of quantum mechanics and it, it has to do with the size of the telescope. So um, it turns out that 10 meter telescopes are good enough to see these bigger gas giants that are pretty far away from the star. But if we want to see things like rocky planets, we need a telescope that's three times bigger. Uh, all right, there's a, a one uh, related to that one, which is I'll ask why gas giants? Why gas giants? I think, um, I think all of the different sorts of planets are interesting. Um, and uh, with gas giants, that is, I, when you look at the solar system, the, Jupiter is the dominant figure in our solar system outside of the sun. It, it contains most of the mass. It contains most of the angular momentum. It tells us a lot about how the solar system formed. Um, I think if we look at other solar systems, like that HR8799 one where we had four gas giants, um, it's a really wild sort of formation mechanism that can make, I mean, each one of those gas giants that I showed you there is 10 times the mass of Jupiter. So how could you get 40 Jupiter masses of planets out of those wide separations. So we're learning a ton about how plants form. When we take spectra of them and, and characterize them, we can learn a lot about how the plants form and about their individual characteristics. And frankly, at some level, we're practicing for Earth-like planets. So when we look at the atmosphere of a gaseous planet, 
We're trying to understand what its composition is. And we better be able to do that by the time we get a spectrum of Earth if we really want to understand what a, what a rocky or Earth-like planet looks like. Uh, all right, so this next one, I'm going to sort of compress a little bit. But uh, so photons carry information in lots of different ways. We measure their amplitude, their wavelength. And uh, the person who asked this question points out that one of those quantities is their polarization. So is there anything to find out from the polarization of, of an exoplanet's light? Yeah, that's a great question. Let me let me go back to um, previous slide that I think will help with this. Yeah, so photons have pol can be polarized, and um, that is a relatively new technique that we're using to try to learn a little bit more about exoplanets. Um, and I think it's one with a lot of potential. So if you were to look at a planet that had, uh, let's say, the bottom half was was bright and cloud free, and the top half was dark and cloudy, it would have a polarized signature. And if you measure this polarized signature as a function of wavelength, you can basically figure out where the clouds are on the planet and what they're made out of. So I think, I think the weather and the clouds on extrasolar planets is a super interesting field and, and polarization helps with that. Um, it also helps separate the planet from the star. So it might make planets easier to detect. And that's because the stars tend to be unpolarized and the planets tend to be polarized. And then one other thing that you might be able to tell from it, if the planet is oblate, so if it's spinning really fast, it might be wider at, the, uh, at its equator than it's, at its poles. And that would also make a polarization signature. Uh, all right, then the next one is about the TRAPPIST-1 system. How far away is it from Earth and how does that distance affect the studies of the system? Um, great question. I don't remember the exact number for how far away it is, but it's relatively close. Um, it is a close by small star. And the closer the star is to us when we observe it, um, the easier it is to, it, you get more photons from the star uh, that allow you to make these these studies faster. So what's really happening with the TRAPPIST uh, system, that's one of those transiting ones where you look at the star and you see the planet go in front of it. And the fact that the star is small, it's both good and bad. Um, if it were bigger, it would be brighter and we would get more photons and it would be easier to detect. But because it's small, the planet actually blocks a bigger fractional part of it. So um, if you imagine, uh, the planet is the size of the tip of my mouse right here. Um, you know, it, it covers a much bigger part of this little red dot than it does of this big yellow thing that's the sun. So we can detect planets like the Trappist planets around small stars. Um, it's very difficult to detect planets like this around sun-like stars. So there was a dedicated uh, instrument, which was called Trappist. It was a group of people, I think, let out of Belgium, which is why the name Trappist came in there. And um, they were specifically looking for transiting rocky planets around the very nearest by small red stars. And because this one is nearby, it's bright enough that we can collect enough photons from it. That's what's going to allow James Webb to potentially study the atmospheres of some of these. Uh, all right, the next question is a little bit back to your answer about the size of the telescope. And this one is, could a phased array of telescopes work better than a single large telescope? Yeah, so um, the question is basically, can you take two telescopes and combine the light and make it into a bigger telescope? And, and the answer is yes. Um, there's a technique in astronomy called interferometry um, where you combine the light from the two telescopes. This is what I did in my previous job. It's, it's very difficult, but if you can do it, you can basically synthesize a telescope that's as big as the separation between the telescopes instead of the size of a single telescope. So if I go back up to uh, this image of Keck Observatory, um, one of the reasons why there are two telescopes is because you can combine the light between them. And instead of having a 10 meter telescope, you you sort of have a 100 meter telescope. It doesn't collect as much light as a 100 meter telescope, um, but it does have that better angular resolution. So you can see, you could potentially see planets closer than the star. And I think um, 
if we ever want to build really, really big telescopes, I mean, at, at a certain limit, at a certain point, we, we can't build primary mirrors any bigger. And we're going to have to use interferometry if we want to see planets closer and closer to their stars. Um, but it is still an active area of research and, and quite challenging to do. Uh, all right. Uh, this, uh, we're going to go a little bit now to, to JWST and a, a couple of questions uh, about sort of JWST and the launch vehicle. Uh, so you know, why, um, where is it? Jeez, I lost it. Uh, why was that launch vehicle, cho vehicle chosen? Is there anything special about the launch site? Why was it sent to French Guiana? So a little bit about the, about the launch. Great. So um, this, this is an Ariane 5 rocket, uh, which is made by the European Space Agency. It's actually quite common for NASA and the European Space Agency to collaborate um, when you're building telescopes that are uh, this long of a duration and this expensive. It's good to work together. We're all studying the same thing. And so with the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, actually anybody in the entire world can use it. So you don't have to be from the United States. Anybody, any, anybody uh, in any country can use it. And, and so for that reason, it made sense for the European Space Agency to contribute the launch vehicle. This launch vehicle was, this is one of the points of this launch vehicle, was that it is exactly the right size to hold the James Webb Space Telescope. That said, they've had a hundred launches before this. And so um, I know there are other newer rocket companies out there uh, that are hoping to launch big things. Personally, I'm happy to have this thing on a rocket that's had a hundred consecutive successful launches. So um, the, the European Space Agency launches all of their rockets from French Guiana. There's actually um, a really big advantage if you can launch your rocket from near the equator. So really what you're trying to do when you launch something is to get it up to a really, really high speed so that it can escape Earth's gravity. And so if you're, um, if you're at the equator, you can take advantage of the Earth's rotation. And so they launch it in the direction that the Earth is rotating and gain that extra speed. And at the equator, you gain more speed, you, you gain some speed. And if you're at the North Pole, you gain zero speed, right? So the, the best place you can be for a launch is right near the equator. You might notice that when the United States launches rockets, they do it from Cape Canaveral, which is about here on Florida. Oh, I might have that wrong, maybe about here on Florida. And, and it's not a coincidence that they launch it from about as far south as you can get in the United States. It's because it gets that extra speed and it takes less fuel to get you where you need to go. Uh, all right, next question. You've got a couple here that are asking, what's a free floating planet? What does that mean? Yeah, um, we're still trying to figure that out. So there's a class of objects, they're commonly called brown dwarfs. Um, and since this wasn't a brown dwarf talk, I didn't, I didn't spend a lot of time defining that, but brown dwarfs are objects that are small enough in mass that they don't have internal hydrogen fusion. And so they get small, basically they start out hot and then they radiate away their formation energy and they eventually cool down and shrink down. And they all end up being about the size of Jupiter. They might have a different amount of mass inside, but, but all of, in terms of the size of the planet, they all kind of look like Jupiter. So um, there's sort of a, a semi-arbitrary distinction Sometimes people say that a, a brown dwarf is something that's more than 14 times the mass of Jupiter and a gas giant planet is something that's 14, that's less than 14 times the mass of Jupiter. That's one definition. Another definition is that something that formed around a star is a planet and something that formed by itself is a brown dwarf. And then my personal favorite definition, a planet is something that formed like a planet. <laughs> so, um, Free floating planets are things that are, I, I, I guess they're things that are less than 14 Jupiter masses. So that's the definition we're using, but they don't orbit another star. And um, we don't really know how they formed, but they look a whole lot like gas giant planets. So that 250 Kelvin, or sorry, if I put that in Fahrenheit, that's about, that's about zero Fahrenheit, something like that. Um, that gas giant that's eight, eight light years away um, it probably looks a lot like Jupiter, and it's pretty close in temperature to Jupiter. It's the same size as Jupiter, um, but it doesn't orbit another star. 
that in some ways makes our lives easier. Remember, trying to see the planet in the glare of the star is difficult. So if you have a free floating planet, it may not have formed by like a planet, but you can learn a whole lot more about it. And it's gonna help us as we start to study gas giants around other stars. All right, another, another definition, this one, everyone's favorite definition. What is the definition of a habitable exoplanet? Oh, yeah, can I give the same answer? A habitable exoplanet is a planet that's inhabited. Um, yeah, we don't know yet. So uh, we've never seen one, of course. Um, I think from what we know from the solar system, if you've got liquid water on the surface, if you've got a rocky planet with liquid water on the surface, there's a good chance life could form there. And I think as just a, a very basic definition of what sorts of planets should be, we be looking for if we wanna find life on other planets. You know, the only example that we know of is a rocky planet, one astronomical unit away from a G-type star like the sun. That, that Earth is the only example we have. And so if we look for planets that are like Earth, that's our, that may be our best chance. But we also don't wanna, cut ourselves short because there might be life that forms on other sorts of planets. So, um, you know, this is a rocky planet that is around a not sun-like star. And there's a lot of argument about whether these planets could be habitable or whether there are difference, enough differences between the sun and this small star that it, it makes it impossible. And, and two differences I'll point out. Um, some of these planets probably always face in the same direction. So one side always faces the star and gets too hot and one side always faces away from the star and gets too cold. And maybe there's a little region in between where you could have life. Another problem is that this star has lots of flares, um, which we think would be sterilizing to our sort of life on Earth. So, um, you know, we're not gonna know for sure until we find it. Um, but right now I think it's it's probably best to take a a pretty broad definition of what might be habitable so that we're not missing out on anything. That is an excellent uh, lead in to the next couple of questions, which I'll combine, which is you talked about looking for signatures of life, but are you looking for other than carbon based life? And how do you know you have to have water in order to have life? Yeah, we do not know that. Um, again, it's, it's the one type of life we know about. And so that's what we're looking for. But there's a lot of interesting work thinking about what types of life could exist on different types of planets. And that includes things in our own solar system, places that there might be life in the solar system that we haven't explored yet. So this is a whole field called, an interdisciplinary field called astrobiology. And we actually have um, an astrobiology institute here at UC Santa Cruz, which is read, led by uh, Professor Natalie Battaglia. And that's what we're trying to think about. We've got the astronomers trying to think about how can we see these plants and what types of plants should we be looking at? And then we've got biologists who are thinking about what are the other sorts of life that could be out there and how do we look for those? Um, and how can we find life if we don't know anything about how it works? Are there certain molecules that you just wouldn't expect to see based on geology? Uh, so I mentioned at the beginning that on earth, we, we don't think you would get oxygen and methane at the same time from anything geological. So um, it must be biological. Now, um, that's a good starting point. I, I, for one, am pretty worried that we're going to look at another planet and we're gonna find something that we say is not geological. And then what do we do? We see some molecules and it could be life, but all we see are those molecules. So there's another way of looking for life, which is to look for techno signatures. Um, and that's sort of the classical SETI search for extraterrestrial intelligence, where you might look for laser beacons, um, people flashing, or not people, aliens flashing a sequence of prime numbers or, or something that wouldn't come from nature. Um, and that's another way of finding it. I think there's also a possibility that we could find some exotic form of life within our own solar system. Obviously, there's been a lot of searching around Mars. Um, there's been increased interest in Venus. Um, because of a claimed discovery of phosphine on Venus, which people think might be, you know, people have to think about how you might form that uh, geologically instead of biologically. Um, I mentioned Titan. I think Titan, I, I showed that somewhat grainy picture hoping you would think it was Santa Cruz, um, but of lakes on Titan. And, you know, the fact that there's something liquid there 
I think makes it a good place to look. I mean, certainly we haven't seen anything yet and we've sent the lander there, but actually there's a new probe going there uh, in the next decade, uh, it's called Dragonfly. And because Titan has an atmosphere, this is a quadcopter that can go fly around um, inside Titan's atmosphere. So I think that's a good place to look. Another place that I think is probably a really good place to look is um, the moons, the, these, these moons that have subsurface oceans. So uh, Europa and Enceladus and a few others where um, on the surface, it's, it's hard, rocky ice. And then, but then underneath, we, we think that there are liquid water oceans. Um, that's not life in the same way that we have it on Earth and that it doesn't get, a, doesn't get sunlight things like that. Um, but we're trying to take a pretty broad perspective of what life could be. Uh, and uh, back to a, a number that you mentioned and that I still find amazing and astonishing. Uh, and so you said that 50% of stars have a habitable planet. And the uh, question asker says, this sounds like a very high number. Please say more. Yeah, it is a pretty high number. So I think, um, there were a number of things that we needed to know before a panel could give a recommendation to build a telescope like that. So this telescope is going to look at not a huge number of sun-like stars. Uh, this telescope is still being designed. It was announced a couple of weeks ago, but you know it might look at 50 sun-like stars um, and with the hopes of finding 25 planets. So if one out of 50 stars had a planet, we would be pretty scared to build a, to spend 25 years building a space telescope like that. And so um, in the last decade, there was a mission called Kepler, uh, which Natalie Battaglia was the project scientist for. And Kepler's goal was to get a statistical sample um, of stars to try to figure out what fraction of them um, have habitable planets. And again, you know, this, this doesn't mean that every, every other star that Kepler looked around had a habitable planet, but they're trying to extrapolate because some of them, they're looking for these edge on planets. Um, if, a, if a stellar system is face on, you won't see it. You only see a, a small number of them. And so um, that mission ended uh, six or seven years ago. And since then people are still pouring through the data and trying to figure out what are the best ways to do these extrapolations. And um, there are a range of numbers. 50% um, is by no means the absolutely correct number. Um, but there are a range of numbers that use different assumptions. And, and it, it's a high enough probability that people are comfortable that we could build a spacecraft like this and take an image of an Earth. Uh, you've got a couple questions. So I think it would be fun to clarify, where will James Webb tel Telescope be in space? And is there an advantage to that? Ah, uh, yes. Oh, and I'm sorry I didn't include a figure of this, but it's um, it's beyond the moon, and it's at a it's at a place called a Lagrange point, which I'll attempt to explain in a second. Which is um, if you make a line between the sun and the Earth, and then you go a little bit further past the moon, um, there's a space. There, there's a place. There, there are a number of these places called Lagrange points, which are gravitationally stable regions, so that while the Earth is rotating around the sun the James Webb Space Telescope is, is rotating with it. And so it takes, uh, the reason you wanna be at a place like that is because it doesn't take a lot of fuel to stay at that position. Um, now there's another option, which is that you can put something in orbit around the Earth, um, which is what we've done with the Hubble Space Telescope. But putting the Space Telescope away from the Earth, away from the extra light and noise that you get from that, and um, James Webb has a sun shield that's similar to this right here, this, this flat panel. And you point that towards the sun and then it's just completely black where you are. And so going at a Lagrange point is a really good way to use your fuel effectively and extend the lifetime of the mission. It's also a good way to be away from the interference of stuff around earth. The downside is that you can't service it. So Hubble, you could service James Webb. Um, it's gonna have to work. And I, I didn't mention this yet, but um, in that first month after the launch, there are 300 single point failures on James Webb, like all these mechanisms, one by one for a whole month, 
are going to have to unfold. Usually when you launch something after the first 10 minutes, if it's, if it's made it that far, it's, it's in good shape, but James Webb, we're going to be worrying about it for a whole month. All right. Well, on that topic, are there plans for a space interferometer? So how about two JNU USTs? Oh, that would be great. Um, yeah, I would love something like that because uh, you could put the James Webb's far enough apart that I, you don't need to stop at two, you can have 10. Um, and you can make a nice synthetic aperture that's much, much bigger than six and a half meters. And that was one proposed way that we might be able to image rocky planets around other stars. So there, there's sort of two ways, build, build a really big space telescope and then get as close in as you can from that or build an, a fleet of smaller telescopes and combine them interferometrically. And I think both would be capable of imaging a rocky planet. And uh, in some ways, the, the goal of the National Academy when they're making recommendations like this, they know that the big thing that's gonna happen in astronomy in the next 20 to 30 years is imaging Earth-like planets. And they have to come up with the cheapest way to do that and the least risky way to do that. Um, so that may be a less exciting answer, but it, you know, you always want to find the cheapest and most reliable way of accomplishing your science. And even though I think a space interferometry or an array of James Webb would honestly be way cooler, um, it's it would take longer to get to our science goal of imaging Earths. Uh, all right. Uh, the next question: Are exoplanets nowadays mostly being discovered through the Doppler method, uh, through transits like with Kepler, or imaging? Well, because the data points to 50% of stars having exoplanets, is the focus on research now more on the exoplanets themselves and not so much on the number of exoplanets anymore? Yeah, that's absolutely right. So um, at first we found these planets through the Doppler method, which is where you see the sun, the star wobbling. And because of that, you can infer the gravitational presence of something causing it to wobble around. And that did pretty well early on. Um, a lot of pioneering work on that here at UC Santa Cruz. The instrument that discovered most of them was um, built here at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and then the transiting method really took off with, with the Kepler Space Telescope. And the goal of Kepler, it was, it was to find a whole lot of planets and to make this statistical sample so that we knew how many of them might be Earth-like. And so, yeah, we found thousands of planets at this point. Um, we have a pretty good not perfect, but we have a pretty good understanding of the statistical population of exoplanets. What types of exoplanets are out there and where they form, what types of stars they form around, where they form around the stars. And so I do think that the next big step is less about finding exoplanets and understanding the populations of exoplanets. And it's more about looking at individual exoplanets and learning everything we can about individual exoplanets and, and the aggregate comparison of, um, of individual exoplanets. So that's where the imaging method comes, comes in. The imaging method has, um, unfortunately for me, not been very successful at discovering exoplanets. They're very hard to discover this way. But once you can see one and you can disperse it into a spectrum, there's just so much more information there. And so that's why this, that's why this National Academy report has recommended you know, exoplanet imaging is a, as a top priority for both the ground and the space, because we've accomplished the goal of finding a large number of exoplanets and understanding their populations. And now the next step is to study their detailed characteristics. Uh, all right, uh, an excellent lead in, since you've talked about spectroscopy being so powerful and you talked about looking for signatures in the atmosphere, how do you tell that something is, for example, a sodium atom? Yeah, so um, so this is what people sometimes call a, a, a spectral signature or a spectral fingerprint. You can take a sodium, you can take some sodium atoms, turn them into gas, um, electrify them, and they will emit at these two wavelengths. And if you've looked at sodium, um, if you've looked at, at sodium streetlights, that's the color that they are. So we've done that at this point, physicists have done that with every atom. And so we have mapped out all of the different atomic lines. Um, so each atom makes many of these lines right here. It's not like each one of these is a different atom. Sodium makes this line and this line and probably a bunch of other ones too. Um, if, I'm, if I'm looking at my colors correctly, uh, 
I think that one is hydrogen. So um, we, we have these libraries that, you know, we have libraries of spectra that tell us what everything is in terms of atoms. Actually, atoms are fairly easy. Um, it's harder on exoplanets because the atoms stick together and make molecules. And molecules have many, many more of these lines um, than the atoms do. And so mapping those out um, experimentally has, has actually been fairly challenging. Um, but it's, it's important so that we can actually identify which, which line is which molecule. Uh, all right, a couple of questions about distance. How far away, uh, given sort of technology, do you think you could possibly find an exoplanet? And someone asked specifically, could you see them in the Magellanic clouds? Have they been found in the Magellanic clouds or is that just too far away? There, there is one example of an exoplanet that was found uh, not in our galaxy. So that's the, that's the world record holder right now. And that was a study co-led by UCSC professor Nia Amara. Um, so typically, I mean, uh, typically the planets that we wanna study directly, the closer they are to the sun, the easier they are to study directly. Um, and so if you look at sort of where Kepler found planets in the galaxy, um, they all tend to be pretty close by just because that makes them easier to discover and to characterize later on. Um, but I do think we wanna understand what are the populations of planets at, at other places in our galaxy and, and maybe in other galaxies as well. Um, because planets may form differently if, if there's a different composition in the galaxy or if you're in a different part that has more supernovae going off. Um, so at this point, I would say we have a pretty good understanding of the population of exoplanets nearby. And there's some reason to think that that's universal, but it would, it would be good to check um, other places in the galaxy and maybe even in other galaxies. Uh, all right, since you've talked about a bunch of different instruments here, uh, let's, let's get some clarification. Uh, where is the instrument scales going to be? So scales, um, scales is being built right here at UC Santa Cruz um, in the labs that are um, where we built many of the instruments that have gone on Keck Observatory. And that process is going to be going on starting around now um, and finishing in 2025. And then in 2025, we will uh, tie it up really nicely and put it on a boat and ship it off to Hawaii. And then we'll all fly out there and make sure it made it there in one piece and attach it to the Keck telescope. Uh, all right. Um, back to the James Webb Space Telescope. Do the seams and the honeycomb design of the James Webb Space Telescope affect the data? Uh, Yes, they do. Um, so let's see, I'll go back to this top image. Yeah, so basically there are these, there are these little seams right there and they don't look like much, but they actually cause a lot of scattered light to get from, you know, light from the star um, might hit one of these gaps and then it, it kind of goes in the wrong direction and ends up right on top of your planet. So the planets that we're looking for um, they can be a hundred thousand or in some cases, even a million times fainter than the star. And even these small little gaps can scatter light in front of your planet and, and keep you from being able to see, um, the really, really faint planets. So I do think that the benefits of these segmented telescopes out, outweigh the issues with that. And, and there are ways that you can try to counteract that scattered light. You can try to mask it out in different ways. Um, the James Webb Space Telescope is interesting. It has been in production for long enough that the science case changed between when it was originally conceived and, and, and when it's being launched. So um, 20 or even 30 years ago, when people were talking about launching a large space telescope like this, the main purpose was um, to look at you know, the first galaxies in the universe at, at really, really great distances. Um, and the exoplanet case has come on more recently. Like I said, the first exoplanet was discovered in 2008. Uh, James Webb has been under development since the, the 1990s. So um, they did not specifically design this mirror to be perfect for imaging extrasolar planets. But once, once that was determined to be you know, an exciting and possible field, a lot of work has gone into making it as good as it can possibly be. And so it's definitely going to do a lot of great exoplanet science. I think that's going to be one of the main things that 
James Webb does. But now, now that we know that that's what we want to do with space telescopes, the next generation, we're going to be more careful with these gaps. Um, they're not going to scatter light. We're going to, we're going to make the surfaces really, really, really smooth. And so that next space telescope that's going to launch in the, the, the big telescope I showed you that'll launch in the 2040s, um, that one will have those segment gaps, but they will not do much to negatively affect the image quality. Uh, all right, a couple about the lifespan of the James Webb Space Telescope and what happens uh, when that lifespan is over. Yeah, so the nominal mission, so, you know, Hubble launched in the 90s and it's still up there. Um, these space telescopes can often last for a long time. Of course, the Hubble was serviced a few times, so that helps. Um, because this is an infrared telescope, um, it has to stay cold for a long time. And they, they specifically designed James Webb to be passively cooled. So we're not sending up a bunch of liquid helium to cool it off. We are relying on solar panels to power it and to run refrigerators. And we're relying on that big sun shield to block the sun and allow it to passively cool. Um, it does have to point around. And every time it points, it uses up a little bit of fuel. And ultimately, um, that's probably going to be its demise. We hope so. We hope it's not some other mechanism failing on it. So the nominal mission lifetime, and this is going to be a little bit shocking, the nominal mission lifetime is five years. And um, when NASA launches something like this, they want to determine what is the minimum amount of time that James Webb can be up there and accomplish its major science goals. And so they've determined that that number is five years. What is likely to happen is that after that five years, if it's still working, they'll say, this is going great, let's keep using it. So I think um, 10 years is quite realistic. And um, af after that, I'm less sure. Uh, all right, this is a follow-up question to your explanation about uh, fingerprints in spectra. And I'm told that the asker is eight years old which is, could we discover new atoms or molecules by seeing unknown lines in the spectroscopy of planets? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I, I think it, at some level, the answer is yes. So, um, but it might not be atoms, it might be molecules. So that's, um, that's a few atoms that are stuck together to make different sorts of complex molecules. So think about hydrogen and oxygen as being the atoms and, H2O as being water, a molecule. So that's one that we obviously know about. But there might be some really complicated molecules that are out there, um, especially in, in, in massive stars, we think that these things form. Um, and yeah, we might, we might discover new molecules in this way. And, and in fact, that's happened. Um, people have discovered new molecules by looking at massive stars. Um, so we'll see. I mean, we found more and more of them. And It'll be harder and harder to find surprises, but I, I, I think it's certainly possible. Uh, all right. Uh, I may have to buy you lunch for asking this next question, but uh, it's, a, it's a little far from what you do, but it's a great question. And, and I, if you can illuminate the answer, I'm also dying to know. So if an alien telescope had been trained on our home planet four or 4.3 billion years ago, would they have been able to detect the carbon isotope signatures uh, from the early presence of life on our planet? Say the, the uh, zircons with biotic carbon isotope signatures from Australia from a few years ago. Oh, wow. Um, so I think that the main thing that we can detect with telescopes in terms of molecules is gonna be in the atmospheres. And so, um, I know that when we talk about imaging Earth-like planets, we, we know that we shouldn't just talk about what Earth looks like today, but we need to think about what Earth has looked like throughout its lifetime. And so there have certainly been um, theoretical studies to try to predict what Earth, or post-dict, I'm not sure, uh, what Earth looked like um, 4 billion years ago and 3 billion years ago and 2 billion years ago. And when I've seen those studies, they mostly have to do with the oxygen content in the planet. And I haven't seen as much about specific carbon isotopes where um, you would generally need very high spectral resolution and very high sensitivity to be able to detect them. I think when we're talking about imaging rocky planets with the next generation of space telescopes, you know, um, 
a spectrum like this is the dream. Um, this is not the highest quality spectrum of an object, that, of an astronomical object that's ever been taken. But if we could get something like this on an Earth-like planet, it would be it would be really incredible. And you know, you can see these different molecules here, and you'll notice they don't have isotope signal uh, signatures next to them. So I don't think we can see different signatures of CO2 or different isotopic uh, oxygen molecules, even though they're probably there. Um, so I hope that partially answers the question. Cool. Uh, all right. Uh, this one, uh, uh, also on the subject of sort of learning things about planets, will the presence of one or more moons help or will it confuse the information about the planet itself? Yeah, so I think um, nobody has definitively detected an, a moon around another planet yet. And I, I think it's got to be coming soon. Um, Earth is actually pretty unusual. I mean, our moon is quite big in comparison. You know, the, the moons of Jupiter are, you know, certainly less than one one thousandth the mass of Jupiter. Um, and Earth's moon is actually pretty big. Um, in fact, if you were an alien astronomer looking at Earth, you would, you would call it a binary planet, I think. Um, so the question is, are the moons going to mess up our interpretation? And I think the answer is probably not in that it's so hard to detect the moons that it's hard to imagine them impacting the larger signatures that we're seeing of the planets. Um, but they may be there. And actually, you, you bring me to a, a point I didn't make. I told you I was going to do... One of, one of the projects I'm leading with the James Webb Space Telescope is to look for these water clouds going around. Uh, oh, this is funny. I can I had a hidden slide here. Let me, let me unhide the slide. Um, I talked about the water clouds going around uh, this free-floating planet. Well, if you look at Jupiter, um, Jupiter has these, these are two moons of Jupiter. And uh, if I were to play a video version of this, they would cross in front of Jupiter, and you could actually see the shadow of them passing in front of Jupiter. And Jupiter would get just a little bit fainter. So if I'm trying to detect these water clouds, yeah, at some level, I could get a, I just want to know if there are water clouds there, but um, I could get a very slightly wrong answer if a moon passed in front of it, especially if it were a bigger moon than the moons around Jupiter. So actually, someone wrote a paper about this earlier this year. They said, hey, these free-floating planets, maybe they're going to have moons transiting in front of them. And maybe if, if you're taking a long time series to measure clouds, you might be able to see a moon going around it. And so I went and did the calculation, and there is a geometrically a 3% chance that I'll be able to see a moon uh, passing in front of this free-floating planet that, with the sensitivity to detect it. Um, so I guess by the point you can detect it, it can affect your data quality. Uh, so, and there's another question, which is, what is the role for smaller existing Earth-based telescopes uh, for exoplanets? Yeah, so one thing that's really important is that, you know, all of these telescopes, it takes a long time to take any of these observations. So um, this observation I've been talking about for James Webb, this water clouds observation, um, that's a 14-hour observation. That's, that's quite a long time. Um, any of these images that we take of extrasolar planets, those take just about all night um, to get an image like that. Um, and so as a result, um, I only get a couple of nights on these big telescopes per year. Um, and there are a lot of studies that require you to look more frequently. So as an example, um, the radial velocity method, which is this indirect way of finding exoplanets and determining their masses. Um, if you want to find a planet through that method, you have to look pretty frequently. And you can do that with Keck, and, and, and we do do that with Keck to, to find especially the highest priority um, low mass planets. But we also have a small telescope. Um, UC Santa Cruz operates Lick Observatory at Mount Hamilton, uh, just outside of San Jose. I encourage you to visit it if you haven't already. And there's a telescope up there called the Automated Planet Finder. And it spends 100% of its time um, looking for these radial velocity exoplanets. And it's not as big as Keck, but that's okay because it's, it's as precise as Keck. It just can't see stars that are as faint as Keck. So there's a good complementarity there. 
Um, and most importantly, we don't have to share it with extragalactic astronomers. It's only for exoplanet astronomers. Uh, all right, we have time for one more, which is uh, how about seeing protoplanetary disks? Yeah, um, I'm really excited about that. It's a big science case for scales. Um, and so this is an example of that right here. Um, this is what we think a protoplanetary disk would look like around um, a star that's maybe 400 light years away. And then we added in a planet and we made it really easy to see because otherwise it would be a boring picture to look at. But I think what's much more likely is that we're gonna see these planets that are really embedded inside the disk and are much fainter than the disk. And that's gonna be sculpting the shapes of these protoplanetary disks. We've already seen protoplanetary disks. We know they have these rings that kind of make them look like um, they might have a planet that's, you know, eating up all of the material that's inside of the ring, kind of like this. And um, so people have worked really hard to try to find, plan find planets in protoplanetary rings to try to understand um, how planets form and how they, how they affect these ring environments. And the problem has been that if you take this blob and you put it inside this ring, if you just take an image of that, you can't tell the difference between the planet and the ring, assuming that the planet is fainter than the ring. And one of the reasons we're building scales is because the spectrum of the planet is different than the spectrum of the ring. The ring's actually just gonna reflect starlight. So it's gonna look a lot like the star. And the, the star is gonna have all of the atoms in it that we've talked about before that are in the sun. The planet is gonna have molecules, things like water. So um, water and maybe methane and things that don't exist in the sun. And so when you do this integral field spectrum of the system, you'll see what basically looks like sunlight in the ring and molecular signatures like water and methane in the planet. And that's how you'll know that the planet is there. In other words, if this planet were on top of the disk, we wouldn't be able to see it with a regular imager. We need something like, like scales to be able to see it. Um, and so that's really one of our big science cases is that these protoplanetary rings that exist around very young stars, we wanna see planets form directly out of them. Um, and because we'll be able to tell the rings and the planets apart, that's gonna allow us to do that. Uh, all right, we're just about at seven. Andy, thank you so much for a great talk and a, and a truly marathon Q&A session. Uh, thank you all of you who tuned in to join us. Uh, I'm really excited to share that our next crawl lecture is gonna be in person in our Silicon Valley Center. Uh, so if you look for the area, please join us on January 19th. The speaker will be Roxanne Beltran, Assistant Professor of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. If you do live out of the area, you'll still be able to join virtually uh, and you can uh, sort that out. I think there's a, there's a link uh, in the chat here, but everyone, thanks very much. Andy, thanks again for, for a great talk. Uh, and for some great Q&A. And please join us next time. Join us in January in person in the Silicon Valley Center.